welcome, welcome back. Good to be here. Yeah. The book is terrific. Thank so you. good. It is terrific. Yeah. And I love that you are narrating it. It's like a podcast, the yeah. audio yeah. book. Because, because I interviewed about 100 people, and they're all in the book. In the book I as well. well. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. quite good. But before we get into the book, mm -hmm. let's talk about the race, the 2024 race, because a lot of hand-wringing is going on. You know, you, you see headlines about how Trump is beating him in certain swing states. He is And it's right quite now. disheartening. I mean, what more does the guy have to do to convince these people that he's, he's inadequate at the very least? What is your point uh, of view It is on close this? right now. I think the polls do show that he's ahead probably in the states that matter. Yeah. The most largely because President Biden isn't doing as well as he did last time with younger voters and black voters. Why? Because of what? Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons for it. But really, I think the most important thing that people should understand about this election is how far from normal mm -hmm. it is. We uh -huh. have never had a former president, presidential candidate, who was impeached and then indicted for trying to overturn an election. Never. Never. In all of our history. We've never had a former president, a presidential <laughs> candidate, who lies about the election that he lost. Yeah. We've never had a former president, a presidential candidate, who refuses to pledge to accept the results yeah. of the next election yeah. if he lost. You know, the peaceful transfer of power is the most fundamental mm -hmm. tenet of our democracy. Yeah. Refusing to accept it, I think, is un-American. I believe it's unconstitutional. And I think it's the job <laughs> of the media to put that into context. You know, it's, I'm not sure exactly. I think part of the reason is uh, the people you were talking about before in that courtroom, mm -hmm. the, 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 the allies of former President Trump who come in, it's the enablers in some way who say, mm -hmm. instead of this being disqualifying, yeah. this is all acceptable. Yeah. You know, this could have been stopped after January 6th. Yes. The, the, Trump was impeached. But the Senate said, we're not going to convict him because, oh, he can be tried in a court of law. Yeah. And now they turn around and say, oh, well, it's illegitimate. You yeah. try him in the court of law. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, George, we have to talk about your book. You have uh, this new book called The Situation Room, which takes us inside kind of the high pressure things that happen in this room. And you've been in here when you worked with President Clinton. And uh, I want to know a few things like what is it like in that room? And I now understand with your description that it doesn't look like it is in the movies. <laughs> not, well, no, no, no. Now it does. But, no. you know, when, when I worked there, which is, you know, unfortunately, a long, long time ago <laughs> at this point, it was it was really just a room, a windowless room with some paneling like very, it had all the charm of a cardboard box. It was not that special. Now, I went back. Uh, right as I was finishing the book last August, before they revealed the new Situation Room to the public, and I walked in, and my first thought was, wow, it finally looks like it's supposed to look oh, wow. in the movies. Now it is straight out of 24. <laughs> well, it is, you know, six different rooms. You see, I got to go there last week oh, as well. Wow. You see that watch center right there where all the people work. Those panels right there, it looks like wood. Yeah. Those are all screens. That's where they can amazing. bring in any information from yeah, around the world fantastic. during a meeting. It's incredible. Yeah. Wow. 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 What uh, things be common. <laughs> yes. I also love, I, the book is so good. My favorite Thank thing you. is that you interviewed Situation Room staff. I've always mm. said that it's White House staff whose names you'll never know that are like the writers of history. They'll tell us so many details. You know, that was my favorite part about doing the book. Mm -hmm. I interviewed about 100 uh, duty officers from the White House. And these are people that come, they're relatively young. Uh, people who come from all over the government, the CIA, the DIA, Defense Department, yeah. military. And, you know, some people like to call those people the deep state. The deep state. Well, uh. the big thing I learned doing this book is that the deep state is packed with patriots. Yes. People who go to work every single day on the front lines of the most intense crises yeah. the country faces and do it to serve their country and to serve the presidency, not the president. They don't care about political parties. They're there to serve the presidency and the institution. Yeah. And they're doing it and anonymously. Absolutely. Exactly. As well, one of them told me, Mike Seeley said, you know, we serve in silence. Yeah. 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 Well, you and I share a common past having worked in the White House for very different administrations. And you and I have both <laughs> spent probably more time than we can even recall in the Situation Room. And to remind folks, it's actually multiple rooms, yes, as you mentioned. Rooms now. Um, the, one of the most harrowing parts of the book is you talking about Bush on 9-11, getting updates and his staff from the Situation Room. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That was an incredible day. Uh, probably the most dangerous day ever mm -hmm. in the Situation Room. Remember, the towers were hit. Yes. The Situation Room got the first news. They're the ones who first uh, relayed to the president, America is under attack. But what was most special 
about that day is that you had all these Situation Room officers, even the ones who were not at work that day, rushing towards the White House, mm. just like the firefighters were rushing towards yeah. the World Trade Center. And the White House at that time, they didn't know when there were still planes in the air whether the White House was going to be targeted. They believed the White House was the next target. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the bosses of these Situation Room duty officers went to them not once, not twice, but three separate times and said, you have got to evacuate the White House every single time these people refused. I talked to one guy, a naval officer named Ed Podinsky, who said, this is where we fight from. They refused to leave, and finally, their boss gave up and handed out cards like this to each person and said, write your name and social security number on this card so we can take it out of the complex. They called it the kill list. Yeah. They wanted to know who might have been trapped in the Situation Room that day. Yeah, how patriotic, mm -hmm. how patriotic. Mm -hmm. um, the book is fantastic, you. you know, it's just so good. Um, and, and one of the things you write about is another sort of, I, I think, a success that happened in that room. Take us back to May 2011, mm -hmm. right? When President Obama and his team watched Navy SEALs carry out the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. Just an incredible day. We've all seen the photo now, right? Yeah. That was actually a room just off the White House Situation Room. The video feed was set up by one of my favorite characters in the book, a guy named Gary Bresnahan, who served seven different presidents. Mm. He was the combination of the MacGyver and the Zelig of the sit room, <laughs> the guy that just sets up all these complicated situations. He was actually asked, when everybody started to go into that room, hey, can you, can you put the feed into the big room? And he said, no, no, I can't do that. And he now, he, he admitted to me it was a white lie. He was afraid to try to change it because he didn't want to break the communications in any way. But that was an incredible success on what was actually a very close call. One of the other truths about the Situation Room is when the presidents are finally dealing with, a, with an, uh, an issue there, it's the closest possible call. They didn't really know it was Osama bin Laden. Yeah. They said it was a 50-50 chance, but he made the call and the rest is history. A certain amount of luck involved. Yeah, Always. definitely. Yeah. Always. George, one of the things that I learned in the book was that Jimmy Carter initially thought that, you know, he was going and, and he had nothing to do with bringing the folks home. But in your book, the hostage you crisis. talk about the fact that he did find out that the hostage crisis maybe went on a little longer to, for him to get out of office. And so Re Reagan could take the, the, the yeah, I mean, it, there's no question about it. The Iranians decided to hold the hostages until after, they waited until the moment yeah. that Ronald Reagan took the oath of office. You know, one of the things that we also learned in the last year was there had always been these questions about whether or not um, somehow the Reagan campaign had, had tried to influence the Iranians to hold. And the Congressional Commission said no, but f last year it did turn out yeah. that John Connolly had gone to the Middle East uh, and, and had meetings yeah. about that that at least suggested um, that something might have happened. But it's like, like Trump saying, don't fix the border until I get into office. Yeah. 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 It's the it's same similar. thing. It, yeah. Yeah. And Very it shows similar. foreign adversaries pay attention to domestic politics. No yeah. question yeah. about that. Um, yeah. But George, I loved this book, except for a very triggering chapter toward triggering. the end. No, no. You write about um, Trump in the White House, and particularly COVID, and what folks might not know is the White House task force on COVID operated out of the situation Inside the room situation. every right. single day. But the whole time I was there, Trump never once attended. Yeah. He did a little bit early on. And you write about the infamous, what became the injecting bleach press yes. conference. These DHS officials, non-scientists, <coughs> presented something. And I've shared before, I tried to stop it outside of the situation room. Tell us about how well, this that unfolded was one of the, and went. That forward. was one of the few times that Donald Trump did go into the situation where he got this briefing. It turned out that on that day, Deborah Burks, who was his yes. COVID advisor, was not in the Situation Room, though she was at the press conference, sure and the, the president had gotten this briefing that, that said something about disinfectant and bleach. It did not say inject No, it bleach talked about how veins. he had, could end up killing the virus. But I literally said, so are you telling the American public, turn your heater up to 95 degrees? Are we creating a run on humidifiers? Like, what's the action item? So he did, yeah, he turned everything, he turned everything around, garbled it up, went out and gave this press conference, but then put Deb Burks on the spot and yeah. said, you agree with that, don't you? Well, and she you can just miserable. see her miserable. She's shrinking into her chair. Shaking her um, head, yeah. But you know, that was also difficult. You know this from being in the White House and some of the Situation Room duty officers at the time were getting very upset because uh, they were told, they had to wear masks all the time in the Situation Room because they, it's a small, confined space, but whenever they left the Situation Room, because of the optics of it, the White House officials in the Trump administration were telling them not to wear the mask, and they thought that was putting them at in tremendous danger. risk. Well, yeah. yeah.
No, it was, it it was, was. really something. <laughs> Wow. It's too crazy. George, it's too short. The time is too short. Did you say you were too short? I did not say that. <laughs> Why are you not the first person who thinks that, right? Get me in trouble. George knows me. George. Our thanks to George Thank Stephanopoulos. You. Thank you, guys. I'm doing this to you. <laughs> the new book is called The Situation Room. It's out right now. And you know what, everybody? You know what? Do you know what I'm gonna tell you? You know what I'm telling you? You are all going home with a copy. It's magnificent. Enjoy.